This is Teacher's Corner from Stenhouse Publishers. I'm Nate Butler. Imagine that you assign a math problem and your students, instead of getting discouraged after not solving it on the first attempt, start working harder, as if on a quest to figure out the answer. They talk to each other and enthusiastically share their discoveries. What could possibly make this fantastic scenario come true? The answer is Open Middle Math by Robert Kiplinski. Robert has worked in education since 2003 as a classroom teacher, teacher specialist for Downey Unified School District, instructor for UCLA, and a presenter at conferences around the world. He's also the co-founder of the website openmiddle.com. With these practical and intuitive strategies, extensive resources, and Robert's own stories about his journey learning to use open middle math problems successfully, you'll be able to support, challenge, and motivate all your students. Today's Teacher's Corner features Robert reading the introduction and chapter one of Open Middle Math. Introduction. What does an open middle classroom look like? The bell rings and lunch ends. Sweaty students gather outside your classroom and slowly shuffle in, finding their seats. As the chatting softens and class begins, they look at you and the math problem you've written on the board. You're trying something new today and are cautiously optimistic about how this unfamiliar experience will be received. The problem looks different from what they're used to, and they wait for you to explain what to do. As you describe the problem, you hear the groans and whispered resistance. Too many of your students believe that math is something where the teacher tells them what to do, and then they repeat those steps dozens of times. This problem doesn't follow that pattern, and they're not sure what to make of it. Once you're done explaining the instructions, students begin working on the problem. They don't solve it on their first attempt, and the lesson begins to feel like many others you've taught. It's what happens next, though, that surprises you. Strangely, many of the students who often give up instead start trying the problem again. The familiar clink of pencils dropping onto the table as students check out is much fainter than usual. Slowly, you start to notice a different energy taking over the room. Kids seem to be on a quest to figure out the answer. Many students begin placing themselves in self-imposed friendly competitions against each other, struggling to see if they can improve upon their previous work. Those you frequently find daydreaming are actually excited to figure out how to get the best answer. Students who have felt comfortable with years of following the steps in their notes are unsure what to make of the experience and have not fully bought in, but you're optimistic that they're on a path towards making sense of mathematics instead of just getting the answer. All you can see from students who normally finish assignments quickly and complain about being bored is the back of their heads and their furiously moving hands. Kids start chatting, going back and forth. Initially, it sounds like they might be off task, but you realize that they're talking about the problem, whose answer is better, and how they got it. In fact, they're sharing math discoveries with each other like they're the first people to realize them, even though you've been telling them those same things for weeks. Minutes fly by, and the time you'd normally spend keeping kids on task is spent guiding students who need help and facilitating powerful classroom conversations around problem-solving strategies. Students still have plenty of misconceptions, but you see them more easily than you ever have before, and they give you a clearer picture as to how you'll want to adjust future instruction. Eventually, the bell rings, but almost no one leaves. Instead, they beg you for a little more time to work on the problem. It feels like you're being pranked, because this can't possibly be happening. You remind them that they'll be late to their next class and have to leave. There is more groaning and whispered resistance, but this time it's for an entirely different reason. Slowly they get up, telling you that they love this problem and hope to do another one tomorrow. Some students are in fact late to their next class, and you get a call from their teacher to verify the outlandish excuse they gave. They said that the reason they were late was because they were working on a math problem in your class and didn't want to stop. Laughing to yourself, you confirm the reason and explain that it won't happen again. The other teacher hangs up in disbelief, and you stand there feeling the same way. You had hoped that this was possible, but it wasn't until you saw it happen that you were able to believe it. This story is not fantasy. Countless teachers have shared similar experiences about how their students responded to the problems and strategies you'll read about in this book. For example, Marguerite Spriggs, a geometry teacher from Long Island, New York, wrote, My first time trying an open middle problem with my students today. Wasn't sure how it would go or if they'd solve it. After a few minutes going at it and coming up with more than one solution, they asked, can we do another one? That was fun, we should do it more. Fifth grade teacher Delena Ellis from Kansas City, Missouri wrote, it was an open middle showdown in fifth grade. They could not stop. One student even asked me for his paper during recess so he could try to get even closer. Eighth grade teacher Pat Walter added, best thing I heard today while my students were doing their open middle bell ringer, 
Go away, Mr. Walter. We don't need you. We're going to figure this out. We love when moments like these happen, but they don't have to be random. With the right problems and planning, we can create moments like these consistently so that students see mathematics in an entirely different light. To be clear, these changes rarely happen overnight. Many of our students think mathematics is about following the steps we give them, robotically computing answers. Shifting students' mindsets away from that reality won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Students who typically succeed in traditional math classes may feel uncomfortable and question why we're not just giving them the formula to solve the problem. It will take time for them to adjust to our new expectations. On the other hand, students who have typically checked out might become engaged thought leaders. These problems and the strategies I'll share for implementing them are not magic pills, but over time you'll notice a huge shift in your, both your students' engagement and their mathematical thinking. I wish I had figured these strategies out earlier in my career because when I began teaching, I taught my students much like I was taught. I showed them how to do a new skill and then gave them worksheets. Often those ones where each problem gives a letter to answer a riddle or dozens of problems from the textbook. Students sat in class working on math like robots waiting for the bell to ring. They were getting correct answers, yet they didn't seem to understand what they were doing. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that these experiences did not meet their needs well, but I didn't know what else I could do. I was discouraged and overwhelmed because I was simultaneously flooded with strategies and resources I found online or provided by my school, yet unable to find the ones that would actually meet my students' needs. I didn't know whether I had already been given what I needed, if it was out there if I looked long enough, or if it didn't even exist. I felt like I could do more, but I didn't feel like I had a path forward that I was comfortable with. I wanted to do better for my students, but I didn't know how to make it happen. It took another 10 years of mistakes and experimentation, but I eventually figured out practical intuitive strategies we can use to meet our students' needs. In this book, we'll discuss those strategies as well as resources that we can use to support and challenge all of our students. When I've used them with other teachers through my trainings and websites, they too found that they were game changers. The teachers talked about being excited and optimistic because they knew what they wanted to do, how they were going to do it, and why it was so important. They described students who were excited to do math and begged for more if they didn't offer these problems often enough. They even talked about becoming the teachers that parents requested for their children. So my hope for writing this book is to share these strategies so that everyone can learn about them. While I'll share successes, I'll also be very upfront about the many challenges and mistakes I've made, as they're a natural part of every person's journey. In chapter one called, How Will These Problems Help Me? I'll begin with a thought experiment that helped me understand how I was able to pass my math classes as a student, yet feel like a fake who could answer questions without really understanding what I was doing. You may find my story startlingly similar to your own experiences with learning mathematics and how some students score well on standardized assessments, yet remain unprepared for their future math courses. In chapter two, we'll talk about how we can stop this disconnect from happening. We'll explore open middle problems that will help us detect student misconceptions and strengthen their conceptual understanding. I'll share sets of three problems at all secondary grade levels from sixth grade through calculus and break them down so you can see how these problems apply to what you teach. You'll solve math problems that require increasing levels of thinking so you can experience the differences firsthand. This essential work will set us up for chapters three and four where we will dive into how to use these problems with your students. We'll begin the discussion about implementation in chapter three, where we'll talk about what we need to do before we use a problem with students. This preparation includes considering how we'll help students feel comfortable with solving a new type of problem in which the steps are not well-defined, how we'll decide which problems to use with students, and how we'll use our planning time to ensure that our lesson both minimizes anxiety and leads to powerful experiences. In chapter four, we'll build upon the preparation we did in chapter three as we talk about actually using a problem with students. We'll begin by examining how to get students started on open middle problems and include real life drama, like what to do if students don't solve the problem using the method we had hoped they would use and what to do if students solve the problem using a method we don't understand. We'll also discuss how to tell when productive struggle becomes unproductive struggle, as well as how to help students get unstuck when they want to give up. Thinking about these sorts of issues will help us learn how to facilitate powerful classroom conversations. In chapter five, I'll show you how to get more problems for your students, including where you can download hundreds of already made open middle problems. We'll also work through a three-step process for making your own problems or modifying existing ones. Finally, in chapter six, I'll encourage you to get started and help you consider your next steps for how to proceed. Each chapter ends with a set of reflection questions because I've found that pausing and thinking about what I've read helps me better understand it. I hope these questions will be helpful for you to think about on your own, with in-person or online colleagues, or as part of a book study or class. Here's what I hope comes next. 
Step one is reading this book for actionable ideas you can use to challenge students, facilitate powerful classroom conversations, and learn more about students' misconceptions. Step two is sharing what you learn in person with other educators and on social media. Be sure to tag me, at Robert Kaplinsky, and use the at open middle book hashtag. Step three is keep coming back to this book when you have a question or need a refresher by looking at the table of contents to find the section that addresses your concerns. Also, if you'd like to download digital copies of the resources I share in this book so you can have them next to you as you read, either text the code OMBOOK, that's O-M-B-O-O-K, to 44222, scan the QR code, or go to robertkaplinski.com slash O-M-B-O-O-K, O-M-Book, and enter your information there. After you enter your information, the resources will be automatically emailed to you. Throughout the book, you'll notice the QR codes in the margins. Scanning them will take you directly to the website mentioned in the nearby text. No teacher likes it when their students have hidden misconceptions that they don't uncover until the big assessment, or when their class has both students who find the classwork too easy and students who are completely lost. I've been there many times, and I've written this book to share everything I've learned about making these issues less common. I hope these strategies will help you along their journey, as I know they've helped me along mine. Chapter 1. How will these problems help me? Have you ever felt like your students understood what you taught them, only to find out later that you were mistaken? This has happened to me more times than I can count. What made this feel especially frustrating was that I didn't see these issues coming during the lessons. It really seemed like they understood I was teaching them, and I rarely figured out that I was mistaken until after I saw the assessment results and was already teaching something else. These experiences made me wonder why I didn't realize these issues earlier. After all, I was asking students questions and they were getting them right. So how was it possible that they didn't understand? What was I doing wrong? I didn't feel like I understood where the breakdown was happening until I came across a thought experiment from philosopher John Surley called The Chinese Room. In this thought experiment, imagine a man who does not speak Chinese sitting in a room. He's been given a box of Chinese characters as well as a book that lists both the characters he might receive from someone outside the room and what characters he should send back in return. Then, a woman who speaks Chinese fluently comes up to the room, writes a few Chinese characters on a piece of paper, and flips the paper under the door. The man inside picks it up, looks in the book to see what characters he should send back, picks the appropriate Chinese characters from the box, and slides a response under the door to the woman outside. Let's consider each person's perspective. The woman outside the room slipped a paper to the man that said, Do you speak Chinese? And received the response, Yes, fluently. So, from her perspective, the man inside the room speaks Chinese. However, from the perspective of the man inside the room, he was just following a procedure he'd been given. He probably has no idea what message he received or what message he sent back. He would likely say that he does not speak Chinese. When I first heard this thought experiment, my immediate realization was, I'm the man inside the Chinese room, but with mathematics instead of Chinese. I remember this phenomenon beginning in my 8th grade algebra class. My teacher would give me a problem that I would solve using a formula I had written in my notes. I didn't really understand what the problem was asking or what the formula did, but I could figure out what information I was supposed to get back in return and turned in the correct answer to my teacher. Let's consider each person's perspective. The teacher gave me a problem to solve and received the correct answer back. So from her perspective, I understood what she was teaching me and demonstrated it by solving the problem. However, from my perspective, I was just plugging numbers into a formula from my notes. I did not really understand what information I received or what I gave back. The only thing I was sure of was that I felt like a fake who did not understand algebra or, later, the mathematics I would do in high school and college. Unfortunately, it's been my experience that many educators can relate to this story, either as the person inside the Chinese room, the one outside of it, or both. As educators, it's scary to think that we may not have the tools we need to determine whether our students really understand what we teach them. After all, we would hope that assessment questions like those on standardized tests would be able to measure true understanding. Maybe not. One impactful moment in my career happened soon after I transitioned from being a middle school mathematics teacher to a mathematics teacher specialist in Downey Unified School District. I was teaching a lesson at one of our high schools, and many of my former students were in this class. The lesson I was teaching that day was on point-slope form, and I was eager to see what they knew. To my astonishment, the students told me that they had never learned about slope. Now, we've all heard something like that before, and maybe sometimes it's true, but this time it was baloney because I was the teacher who had taught it to most of them in 7th grade. 
I was stunned because the vast majority of these students had earned advanced or proficient, one of the two highest levels on our state standardized tests. How was it possible that students could earn such high scores and not be able to build upon what they knew? They didn't even have a memory of learning about it. I reflected on this for quite some time, and what I finally came to realize was that I was the problem. I felt embarrassed because while I thought these kids were proficient or advanced, I was wrong. Many students were really at much lower proficiency levels, but I didn't have a clue. Looking back, I realized that when they were in my classroom, I had asked them superficial questions about slope. I came to understand that when I asked students superficial questions, I got superficial information back about what they knew. I clearly had students with huge gaps in their understanding, but I couldn't identify who they were or where they had misconceptions. In retrospect, I realized that this made me feel especially awful because I was repeating the pattern and putting my own math students inside the Chinese room. I was slipping problems under the door for students to solve, and they were returning correct answers that made me think that they understood what I was teaching them. I realized that I needed to find a more reliable way of determining whether students authentically understood what they were learning instead of just repeating the steps in their notes. I wish that I had something like x-ray vision glasses, which could let me look into their brains and see their mathematical misconceptions. It was a challenging emotion to process, but I was motivated to find a reliable way to determine where my students struggled and help them develop deeper mathematical understandings. I needed to break my students out of the Chinese room, and I realized that my overemphasis on students' answers instead of their mathematical thinking was part of the problem. I needed a different approach that would value their journey toward the solution as much as the solution itself. I wanted kids debating about the best way to solve the problem rather than simply racing to get correct answers. I wanted them to use more strategic thinking instead of mindlessly using the formula I had just given them. Most of all, I wanted to know when my students had misconceptions so I could do something about them. After learning from experts like Norman Webb and Dan Meyer, and then much experimentation and collaboration with my colleague Nanette Johnson and others, more on this in chapter two, I figured out how to make and facilitate a kind of problem that would do just what I was looking for. These problems, called open middle problems, help me identify students' misunderstandings even when the kids don't realize that they have any. They motivate both students who struggle as well as those looking for more challenge, all while having kids engage in craving more mathematics. You can easily substitute the problems for what you're already doing with your students instead of adding yet another item to a jam-packed school year to-do list. To be sure, using open middle problems does not eliminate student misconceptions entirely. However, since using them, I now see student misconceptions more clearly and can use them as talking points to strengthen mathematical understandings during the lesson instead of simply lamenting missed opportunities afterwards. I've also used them to make more meaningful assessments that provide me with richer information using fewer questions. This type of assessment gives me more accurate results and allows me to spend more time on instruction and less on testing. I hope you're excited to see how you could use these problems to help your students. So let's explore open middle problems to see how they're different from some of the other problems we've used. Reflection questions. Here are some questions for you to reflect on by yourself, with your colleagues, or on social media using the open middle book hashtag. What was a time when you felt like your students understood what you taught them, only to find out later that you were mistaken? How is it possible that students could correctly answer questions on standardized tests, yet not fully understand what they had learned? How would having a clearer picture of students' understandings and misconceptions affect how we taught them? Open Middle Math is available from Stenhouse Publishers. You can catch Robert Kaplinski online at his websites robertkaplinski.com and openmiddle.com and at his Twitter handle, at Robert Kaplinski. I'll leave links in the description. And that wraps up another episode of Teacher's Corner. Check out our website at stenhouse.com where you can find podcast archives, book previews, study guides, and more. If you haven't done so already, we'd appreciate it if you can take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever podcast player you use. It means a lot. And if you've done so already, thank you. Please consider sharing this with a friend or colleague who you feel could get something from it. And as always, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Send your thoughts to us at marketing at Until next time, stay safe, sane, and healthy.